my name is Ben Sherman. Uh, I work for Chai One in Houston. Uh, I'm a Microsoft ASP Insider and MVP, a certified Scrum Master, and I've sort of left the .NET community and uh, have been doing full-time Rails and iPhone since uh, February. And I'm not at all affiliated with Heroku. I just really, really like their stuff. So let's say you have this awesome Rails app that you've been working really hard on, maybe by yourself. In startup mode, you have a limited budget. But eventually, you're going to need to deploy it. So some of your choices that you have in the deployment arena is shared hosting, uh, virtual dedicated, and dedicated. Anybody here use shared hosting in the past? So it's pretty great. You know, it's like five bucks. They'll put your app on the server. And of course, that server costs money. And they have to pay for the bandwidth of that server. So they're going to put another app on it. And probably another one. And before you know it, that server gets overloaded with applications. And you're then competing for resources on a, on a single box. So shared hosting kind of sucks. Um, in addition, you're probably tied to one Ruby version. And uh, it's usually outdated. So if you want to run a Rails site on a shared host, uh, you've got to get a good one. And so and this is virtual dedicated. And virtual dedicated is a lot better because you're still sharing uh, raw metal with other people, but you're isolated. And you can generally have a guaranteed amount of RAM. Uh, but of course, it's a lot more expensive. You can spend you know, $20, 30 $40 uh, to start up uh, on a virtual server. But they're a little bit more portable, and you can scale them up. You know, if you need to grow your application, you can add more RAM for more money. And then there's dedicated, which is awesome. Everybody likes you know, computers, but they're expensive. So then what about scale? So like, how do you scale a website? Let's say we have our application, and we chose one of those options. And we've got a database server running on the same machine as the web application, and we've got a few users. So let's say our user base grows a little bit. We might decide to uh, change off, move our database server off to the other tier to another box to leave the uh, web server just for serving web requests. And of course, you know, hopefully our business will grow and we'll get more customers. And then all of a sudden, we have another problem. We've got to add more servers. We have to uh, do master-slave on our database to send writes to the master and uh, reads to the slaves. And then we probably need a load balancer to, to share the load between multiple web servers. So let's say we, we have this awesome problem of having lots and lots of customers. And we end up with this you know, telescopic problem of we need lots and lots of servers, and each one of those needs a redundancy. Uh, we need load balancers. We need sharding on our databases. So we send you know, a certain number of records to this system, a certain one to this one, and, and, and so on. What would happen if I were to, say, write something to the local file system on one of these web servers? Right? Your web request, a subsequent web request, might go to a different server. So you can't rely on the fact that there's you know, a local file system on any of these things. And server memory is another issue. You know, if you're storing session state in server memory, uh, you've got to watch out there as well. So if we started off on just one server, uh, our own server, and we weren't sort of playing in those guidelines, and we might have problems scaling up later. In addition, it takes a pretty good skill set of somebody to manage this infrastructure for you. And me as an application developer, and probably most of us in here, um, I, I know enough to get my hands dirty, but uh, like somebody said earlier, I don't know how enough to get them clean again uh, when it comes to IT admin. So I'm going to change the subject just for a minute and talk about scale and scale on demand. So if we go back to the slide for a minute, if all of these are our servers and we're paying for bandwidth and we're paying for the hardware, uh, that's pretty expensive. And sometimes we don't need all of that all the time. For example, if we have a number of users by the time of day, you can easily see here that we need the scale during this period, but we don't necessarily need it you know, during the hours of 9 PM to 9 AM. Why not try and save some money there? Another scenario is an expected PR campaign. We might get a sudden rush of users, and it'll settle down to some reasonable, reasonable value. But we don't necessarily want to blow our budget on servers just in case we might handle that, that amount of load. So wouldn't it be cool if we could just crank up a dial and then crank it down again and only pay for what you use? Wouldn't that be awesome? All right, yeah. 
All right, so I want you to forget about servers for a minute. And I'll talk about Heroku. So Heroku, you can install it as a gem. Gem install Heroku. It's a platform as a service for rack-based apps, so you can serve up you know, Sinatra or Rails or whatever. You can scale easily by adding what are called dynos. Has a really, really cool workflow, which I'll show you in a minute. It's free to start, which is, I think, one of the most important things about a service like this. There's a lot of cloud offerings out there, but you need to be able to tinker with them. In fact, my first Rails website that I deployed into production, I put on Heroku, and I was able to, uh, uh, it lasted for about eight months on the free plan. And that was eight months I did not have to pay, you know, 30 bucks a month for a virtual host or five bucks a month for a shared host or whatever. Uh, it's also got a complete command line API, which is what we'll use the most. So this is how you deploy a Rails app. So assuming you don't already have a Git repository, we're going to initialize one, add all the files, commit them, then you run Heroku create, which gives us this nice Zen name of morning summer 18, and then we push it. And uh, anybody here not familiar with Git? Okay, good. So you can probably tell that Heroku is just another remote on our system. So it can be the same Git repository that you commit to your regular source code, whether you're on GitHub or wherever. And so we just push our changes to the Heroku remote and it puts our site online. So let that soak in for a second. We didn't deal with any servers. We didn't deal with any Capistrano recipes. I didn't know how to set up Nginx, Apache, Mongrels, any of that. Yay, big win. So I really want to stress that I really like using Git for deployment. I didn't have to SSH anywhere. Uh, I really, really think that's a fantastic solution. OK, so Heroku is built on some common things that we're all familiar with. Um, Amazon Web Services, EC2 specifically, uh, caching layer with, uh, they, they do HTTP caching with Varnish, which is really, really fast. Um, so if you're serving up static pages, uh, you get that for free. Uh, they run on Debian Linux. There's this Erlang routing mesh, which basically routes the request through the caching tier to whatever dyno your application is running on. And uh, the web server is Nginx, and the database that you'll be using is Postgres. So that's actually probably the most important thing to note is that you use Postgres on the server. And if anybody's ever used MySQL locally or SQLite locally and then deployed to Postgres, you might be in for some surprises, like, for example, case sensitive like statements and uh, some other just database specific things. So I recommend running Postgres locally just so that you have a consistent environment. So this is their pricing page, which, among being just cool to look at and play with, um, well, is pretty informative. On the left side, we have the database. Uh, basically, you choose based on your size of database and whether you want shared database or uh, dedicated. So in my case, on my first production Rails app, my database was less than five megs, so I was able to stay on that one for a long time. And on the right side, where it says dynos and workers, you charge, you're given one dyno for free, and you can scale up from there for pennies per hour. So to give some context, uh, uh, was it Flightcaster? Anybody familiar with Flightcaster? OK, so for those that don't know, uh, Flightcaster promises that they'll tell you when your flight is delayed before the airlines will, and they're pretty accurate. So they gather tons of data, and they serve up, the, you know, they have a website. Uh, they run on three dynos, which is like a big, pretty big uh, application is able to run on three dynos. So what the hell is a dyno? Uh, I didn't know. A dyno is sort of like a mongrel in that it will only serve up one concurrent web request per second. So in the free plan, similar to a grocery store, you know, you walk in and you've got this guy who's got cheese whiz and beer in front of you and he's going to pay with a check and use 10 coupons. Um, you have to wait for him until they open up another lane. So these requests are going to come into the system and be served up one at a time. So if you get a really fat request in the system, it's going to delay everybody else. So we add a dyno for money. Then we get both of them at the same time. So we improve our throughput through the system. So how do you know when it's time to add, go from the free dyno plan to the you know, adding more? Obviously, increasing response times. 
the person at the end of the line has to wait until he go through that backlog until he gets to a valid dyno, an open dyno. And uh, you should be watching those. And then you might not be watching those, in which case if you get you know, that million users that I was talking about earlier, you'll probably get this backlog 2D error, which means um, I don't remember how many are in, or too many in the backlog, but it's, it's like 100, which is a lot. Uh, and so at that point, they're going to start throwing 500 errors because by the time you get to those requests, they're going to be so far gone, the browser might have timed out already anyway. So of course, you should always measure so that you know what your performance is. And you can do this with a couple of tools. One of them is New Relic RPM, uh, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. Uh, New, New Relic RPM is a plug-in with Heroku. So you basically just click a box, say, yes, I want it, and it's automatically installed. And uh, you go through there, and you, it'll show you how many requests per minute. And you can see in this uh, fuzzy, you know, low-res diagram that we're getting, you know, a few requests per minute. And then all of a sudden, the requests per minute start scaling up, right? We're getting more traffic. And we're handling it okay, except the backlog's starting to grow. And that's what these yellow bars are. They're showing you your backlog depth or your queue depth. So in this case, uh, during those periods, we had a queue depth of one one and then it went up to two. So you can see as, as we get more web requests, the queues are gonna get longer and longer. And unless we either get less traffic or we crank up our dynos, we're gonna start, that, that number is gonna start growing and eventually you're gonna start throwing out 500 errors. So it's always important to measure to see what your uh, performance is. Uh, you can use Apache Bench. It's probably already on your machine. Uh, so you can type AB and take a look at the docs for that. But basically, you can run, say, you know, 40,000 requests, 20 at a time, and see the numbers that you get back from that. So some tips that I've come to use uh, in my time with Heroku. Uh, you can use multiple Heroku apps in the same folder. So say I have a, an application, you know, <laughs> my blog, and I want a uh, blog's a stupid example. Um, <laughs> Uh, my awesome randomizer for conference uh, prizes, um, and I want a testing and a staging and a production environment. So you can just create a new Heroku app for each one of those. And uh, when you do that, every Heroku command, you just have to append with dash dash app and the app name. So um, where I work, when we deploy, we deploy to dash dash app, you know, app dash test or app dash staging or app dash production, and it'll go to that correct environment. Anybody in here use TAPS? Okay, for those that don't use it, do you know what it is? Okay, man, TAPS is so awesome. The creator of TAPS is actually here. I think he's preparing his keynote. Um, TAPS is a uh, solution for serializing schema and data from a database in a database agnostic way and pushing that to another server. So. Uh, Heroku aside, you can run TAPS as a server on both ends. Say you've got you know, a Linode and a Slice host, and you want to move a database that's MySQL over here to a database that's Postgres over here. You run TAPS on both sides, and you can send off all of those, all, all of those uh, records um, on a fresh database. It works really, really well. Uh, Heroku leverages this, so you can say Heroku DB push and Heroku DB pull, and it will work with SQLite, MySQL, or Postgres. Uh, so if you have some development data that you want to push out to, to your site on the internet, you just say Heroku DB push. So we do this, we take data out of our production environment, we pull it down locally, and we push it up to our test environment. So we are always working with, with uh, relevant data. Of course, stuff goes wrong every once in a while. So you can uh, type Heroku logs and you'll get like the last hundred lines from your log. Um, of course, if errors come in, if you add the exceptional gem, uh, you'll get all those exception, uh, the stack traces and everything uh, through the exceptional service. And there's Heroku console, which is just like your local Rails console, but on the server. And I already mentioned New Relic and exceptional, but those are just two of the many add-ons that you can just go in and check, yes, I want this. And those are both free, by the way. Okay, so every, every one of us has probably been in a situation where uh, we deploy something and it doesn't work. Um, so we kind of want this oh shit button that we can back up to what we were before. And in the Heroku world, that's called a bundle. 
And for free, as an add-on, you can add a single bundle. So what that'll do is it'll take your database, you know, all your data, take a snapshot of your database and all your code, and zip it up for you. And then later on, you can reanimate that bundle. And it's really useful, uh, but only having one bundle only gives you that one window. So you can add on other bundles for free, or not for free, for, for money, to have unlimited bundles so that you can capture a bundle every time you do a deployment and you can always roll back to another one. Uh, but we're still on the free bundle plan and we've found a, a little way that we can work with this, uh, with a rake script. So I have a backup task in a rake script. Can you guys read that okay? I'm gonna highlight them as I go, so. So the first uh, thing is to just set the name of the uh, bundle and the Heroku app that we're using, and I pass this in as a command line parameter. So I just say app equals in my app name. And this is just a, a function that's gonna call the Heroku bundles command on the shell, and then wait for the text that I specify, because what will happen is I say, when, I, when you capture a bundle, it's not gonna be there like right away. So I've gotta wait until the bundle's actually there. Um, so I use that in a couple of places, so we just have a helper method here. So the first step is to check for an existing bundle. Because we're on the free bundle plan, uh, we can't capture a bundle if there's already one in there. So what we do is we look for a bundle that's there. If there is one, then we destroy it. And you'll see why in a second. Then we capture the bundle. So by running the Heroku bundles capture method, or uh, command. Then we download the bundle and just put it in a local backups folder. And then you could also easily just use one of the Amazon S3 libraries on Ruby and put it in S3. Uh, that way you have a copy of it at any point in time. And then uh, this is where we put that file. So uh, you can't easily give Heroku a backup that you saved on disk and have them reanimate it. So it's still valuable to have the unlimited bundles plan, but this is a way that we were able to uh, cope with the free single bundle plan. And so then we do one-button one deployments with Heroku. Um, like this, we I didn't do the, the, the nice highlighting on this one, but so that first block, it turns maintenance mode on. So basically just your app changes to a static page. It says maintenance. And uh, I believe that causes your slug to be recompiled on Heroku. So you can't uh, do a git push immediately after setting your maintenance mode on. So we sleep for a few seconds. Then we do a git push to that remote. So if I'm, if I'm deploying to test, we're gonna use the test git remote. If we're deploying to production, we'll use a production git remote. Once those changes are there, you're gonna need to migrate your database. And you can do that with Heroku rake db migrate. And then in some cases, you'll have config variables like S3 keys or, or chargeify keys or whatever. And so we'll loop through a, a hash there to put those up on Heroku. And then finally, we'll turn maintenance mode off. So these were tasks that we had to do repeatedly every time we did a deployment, and so we want to be able to do those uh, a lot quicker. So delayed jobs is something that I just recently came across. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, getting your dynos or your web requests as slim as possible is really key to leveraging the most out of the dynos that you have. So if you have uh, some, some stuff that may not uh, belong in the web request, but um, has to be performed, you might push that off to a queue and have it run later. And one example of that is sending uh, bulk emails. In this case, there's really nothing we can do except tell the user that we sent them because that thing is going to take a while. Some of them might fail or whatever, uh, but the user wouldn't be really be able to do anything about it. So uh, at this point, they're probably waiting for a little while while we go fetch all the emails and we send them all, and meanwhile, we're plugging up that dyno. Uh, from, from serving up other requests. So if you have delayed jobs, you can just change this. Instead of saying send a ton, you say send later and pass in send a ton as a, as a symbol. That's all you do. It inserts that into the queue, and then later on, the uh, worker is going to pick that up. So that way, you immediately return from that method and are able to keep your web requests fast and responsive. So some other scenarios that might be useful is uh, sending off metrics or analytics to a third party. Uh, to install delayed job, you just do gem install delayed job. Uh, that comes with a migration, so you have to generate it. So you type Rails G delayed job. This is Rails 3, by the way. And uh, then you do rake db migrate, which will create the queue table for you. You can scale up your workers. 
by saying Heroku workers and the number of workers you want. And you can also do relative numbers, so you can say plus one, minus one, and it'll tell you how many is running. So I, I just found out this today that um, you charge five cents per hour per worker on the same slider thing on that pricing that, um, page that I was showing you earlier. So I did the math, and that's 36 bucks a month, which is kind of hefty from like, okay, I'm on the free plan, and I need a worker, and all of a sudden I'm at 36 bucks a month. It's kind of like a weird jump. And I probably only need that job running every once in a while, but it's, you're going to be charged even when you're not processing the jobs. So I thought it would be really cool to, um, to write some magical script that would check the, the queue to see if you have any jobs to run, and then scale up if you do, and scale down if you don't. It turns out somebody had already done this. I pasted the, or shortened the URL there for you if you're interested. Uh, but it's basically Pedro's fork of delayed job. And what he did, which is pretty, pretty cool, oops, let me go back. Uh, in the, he basically patched the job class. So when it is created, it checks the quantity and scales up. So if uh, the manager, the manager is just some Heroku manager class that he wrote. And if it doesn't have any, uh, if, if it doesn't have any jobs and this is the first one, then it's gonna crank up a worker. And then in the worker class, once it's finished, it's gonna scale down if that was the last job. So at this point, like, as soon as your queue is empty, you're not charged for workers anymore, which is a pretty, pretty elegant solution. I like that a lot. So there are some gotchas. Like I mentioned, there's a read-only file system. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna write your application in a way that's scalable across servers, it's not a good idea to write to local disk. Uh, and because of that, some gems don't work. Um, like for example, uh, uh, Paperclip, I think you have to change the temp directory where Paperclip uses. Uh, Roku does give you a temp directory that's writable, but you obviously shouldn't store stuff there, it's temporary. Uh, Radiant CMS is another one that I had trouble getting working. Uh, and the reason was there was no uh, git submodules support on Heroku. Uh, but there's ways to get around that by making those submodules first class files in your git repository. Um, so whatever, oh yeah, SSL and memcached uh, and full text search are a little bit expensive, I think. Um, aside from that though, I mean, we're able to get up really quickly and uh, you know, we're happy to pay for the things that we end up needing, uh, like SSL recently, and I, I can see us uh, move into memcached pretty soon. And then the last thing is that they're bound by Amazon's SLA, so by definition they're gonna be you know, a little bit less than Amazon's <coughs> uptime. Uh, so that's the only gripe I really have is that we can't guarantee you know, nine nines of uptime uh, because they're built on Amazon's in infrastructure, which does go down occasionally. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and do a little demo. We're done here at four? Yes. Yes, all right. All right, so I've got this little Rails app here. And it doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, in fact, I'll show you. It's got a couple of controllers, one for managing projects. And it just uses scaffolding, so I can just go in here and type stuff up. And then it's got a issues controller to have like issues for those projects. So I like this application, and I'm gonna put it up on Heroku. So, everybody read that? Should I bump up the font size? Yes, sir. How's that? Good. Okay. So I'm gonna create a new Git repository, add my files. Okay. Now I'm gonna say Heroku create, and I can give it a name at the end, or I can just hit enter and get uh, a Zen name created for me. Quiet Night 20. All right, so now we have our Git remote and that's gonna be our URL. So I'm just gonna push to that URL. Anybody timing me yet? 
So actually, when I, when I titled this talk, it was a scalable Rails app deployed in 60 seconds. And then all of a sudden, I started using uh, Rails 3 and Bundler, and uh, Heroku sort of switched off to using, um, uh, to where you specify all of your gems, so including Rails. And so that sort of cranked up the time it took to spin it up a little bit, but uh, pretty close anyway. Anybody have any questions while this is running? Oh, it's a, how does Heroku know what gems I have? So um, before Bundler, uh, you would use a .gems manifest file, which is, uh, you just check out the Heroku docs, and you basically just paste in the names of the gems in a file. So it doesn't read your, like, config docs. Right, right. Okay. I think before it, because it's not necessarily Rails specific. So if you're running a Sinatra app, for example, then you have to tell it before it boots up the Rails app. Okay. So, uh, quiet night 20. And we have a Rails app on the internet. It's pretty, pretty impressive, I think. Yay? Yay? All right. All right. All right. So now I'm going to go add a project. And oh, wait, something went wrong. Anybody know what went wrong? Ah, oh, you guys have done this before. OK, so Heroku comes with a ton of commands. In fact, I'll just hit Enter and show you. You can basically control almost the entire thing from here. Uh, and so what we need to do is Heroku rake db migrate. And I did include the delayed job gem in this. So uh, it should be created. That table should be created for us. And I also added a, a generate um, uh, generate action on my issues controller so that I could generate uh, a bunch of issues, just test issues. And so it's basically like generate 100 issues. And you don't necessarily want the user waiting around for that for the web request to return. So now that that's done, I should be able to go over here and refresh this. Looks like it should have run. Oh, I didn't have to do this earlier. All right, let's take a look. Heroku logs. This is all part of the part of the talks, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. There it goes. OK. Interesting. That was weird. Um, OK. So, but my projects that I had nice and formatted on my local machine weren't, aren't there. So, um, and it took me a long time to create both of those records. So what I'm going to do is just say Heroku DB push, uh, which, oops, I don't have taps installed. So let's do that. Gem install taps. Did you have a question, or you were just going to tell me that? Jim? Yeah. Oh, OK. Any other questions while this uh, gem is installing? Yeah. So can you have multiple apps under one free account? Yes. I have like 25. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of them, I mean, I think it's really great because I'm using it more. Most of the sites get zero traffic, but it's just a way for me to keep my sites deployed. And then some of them, like my ones at work, uh, eventually, we need bigger than a five meg database, so we start paying for that. And eventually, we need SSL, so we pay for that. And in general, you know, if you were to set up like a slice host or Linode, you know, you're paying thirty something bucks a month for even the time during development where you don't need it. So I think there's a big win for small companies that are on a budget. And I should have not installed RI. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because when you look at yeah, when you look at the your your Heroku uh apps page 
well, I'm not going to do it right now, but yeah, you'll see like a bunch of apps and then you don't remember what they were. All right. Note to self, no RDoc next time. You have a question? Right, so the one bundle that's sitting on Heroku can be animated. But I kind of want to have a history of all my backups locally, just in case. So, yeah, that is dangerous, obviously. Like, oh, we have a backup, but we can't put it anywhere. Um, so, if, yeah, I would tell. Yeah, so, so I, I could even show you if I have time. But you'll, uh, so that's why we delete the old bundle and capture the new one. And then at the end of the deployment, if we broke everything, I can just say Heroku bundles animate and then bundle name. And it'll restore the old bundle with data and code. So it's just the last one that's the one I can restore. And so I just save them locally just in case I need them or if we need to put it on another server somewhere. But uh, so just to yep. add to that, you can, you can take any of your older bundles, restore them locally, like at the database that's locally, and then do, do, do a DD push. Oh, yeah. And that's smart, Jesse. Where do you work? <laughs> <laughs> You had a question? So there are times when uh, using zero push is uh, the remote came from unexpectedly. It just it will just hang. Yeah. It, the other, does the other message say your slug is being recompiled? No. It's, it's already compiled, but uh, I don't often verify after like two, three hours. Um, I would check status.heroku.com just to make sure that when you were having that problem that there were no issues. Uh, so like all systems go right now which is good for my talk. But um, yeah, I mean, like. Cancel the card, yeah. What's, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, occasionally we run into snags, but I, I'd say the biggest snag that I've run into is I try to, I turn maintenance mode on, and then I immediately after do a push. And this is something recent. I don't know if it's because this app is growing bigger and my slug size is bigger, uh, but these, these slugs are, you know, packaged up version of your app. And in order to keep them portable, um, I'm assuming that's what it is. They keep them portable. Um, they have to compile the slug, right? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so that's why I added a sleep in the script so that after I turn maintenance mode off on, for whatever reason, it causes a slug recompile. So then I've got to wait. Like I said 15 seconds on here. When I tried it this week, it was more like 60 seconds for this one app. Okay, I'm going to do this Heroku DB push. And it's going to tell me that the database will be overwritten. And sure, why not? See a prompt, hit yes, enter. And you can specify which database. I'm just using the default. So it's going to use my dev database and push it onto the production database on Heroku. But see, it's getting you know, indexes, all the data, all the tables, all the records. And I refresh. And then there. So a question over here somewhere? Yeah. You mean in Git? Yeah. It's like, it's like a specific slug ignore. That's like ignore. <laughs> There's a slug ignore file? OK, yeah, that's, yeah. OK, did everybody hear that? If you have files that you don't necessarily need on the production server, then you add a .slug ignore file, and it will be ignored. OK, so now we have our handcrafted projects that we wanted in our solution. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the, uh, if we go to issues, uh, I don't think there are any. OK, good. And I type uh, generate, which is my you know, batch run action that should be inserting this into a queue. So if you notice, it's not there yet. It generated five, uh, 100 issues, but they're not there yet. And let me do this, Heroku workers one. And it's now wanting run worker, one worker, and I'm being charged five cents an hour. Yeah, I left my worker running all night because I thought that it was going to not charge me while it wasn't running. So there goes a couple dollars. 
And at some point it should add, yep, there it goes. All right, so then you know, my worker was the one who went in and added all these things. And another point, and a cool thing to note is that delayed job will capture errors, stuff the error message in the queue, and that it'll uh, do a, a exponential retry on that. So when I was actually searching for how to get these things to retry, it retried on its own and I had already fixed the bug and it worked. But I'm out of time. Any last questions before I wrap it up? Yep. Will Heroku have a, a, a remote uh, logging solution at any point? Uh, there is Logworm, which is in private beta, and I'm really thinking I might get in soon. But yeah, Logworm, you can basically send them all the logs, and hopefully we can just have that for all of our applications, just send them all the logs. Because when you do Heroku logs, because it's running on multiple machines, uh, sometimes the log statements are like not in order. Uh, like, and you'll get new relic, you know, type of logging statements in there. So, yeah, and it's only a hundred lines anyway. So you got to be there when the issue happened to run Heroku logs. So that's a good, good question. And I think there's some shirts up here. Yeah, how do you want to do that? Uh, four shirts. Four shirts. All right. How do you want to do that? Uh, <laughs> run up here. All right. You, 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 and. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we could send him a text message. We could, but. Man, yeah. I wish the one who told me to come to the That was, all right. All right, Scott, come on up. Do you have a tiny shirt for Scott? <laughs> all right, thanks a lot.